Well, good morning, everyone. Let me pray for us, and then you can take a seat. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thanks so much for speaking to us through your word this morning. We pray, Lord, as we consider it now, that you'd change our minds and hearts, change our shape, make us more like Jesus, we pray. In his precious name. Amen. Please take a seat. She sat in her, <coughs> excuse me, in her bed just a few doors down the corridor from the entrance to the nursing home. I didn't know her. But as I visited others around her, an image was impressed into my mind over the three years that I was in Gunnedah. I was seeing something wonderful. I can see it as plain as day, even now, if I think about it. Her door was open, and on the left side of her bed, as I walked past the door, her husband sat. Sometimes reading to her, sometimes reading to himself, sometimes holding her hand, sometimes watching her sleeping, sometimes resting himself. But I can't think of a time when I did not see him there. The scene so got into my mind that I asked the staff about that couple and what I was told really did change my world to some degree. The lady, I was told, no longer recognised him, hadn't actually recognised him for years. She rarely spoke to him or acknowledged him. And yet each day he would drive up to the nursing home, he would park his car and he, was, he would keep his promise to her. For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. This is my solemn vow and promise. And no medals came his way as far as I'm aware. No TV cameras recorded it. As far as I know, no uh, newspaper <coughs> articles were written about him. But what I saw may have been one of the greatest graces ever given to the humankind, I think. A promise being kept. Now, over the next two weeks, we're coming to the end of our journey through the book of Genesis. Uh, we've been on quite a journey together, haven't we, over nearly a year now. The book of beginnings. And I hope it's been an enlightening journey for us. Now, right at the start, I said that we could easily get derailed like so many do uh, and focus only on the first chapter and the story of creation that gets so much attention. Are these literal days? Did it all happen only 7,000 years ago? What about the dinosaurs and carbon dating? But Genesis is so, so much more than that. Such a sadness to be stuck there rather than to see it in its fullness. And so what we've tried to do is to, to stay hard, to stay firmly with what the story says, with what God says to us actually rather than being distracted by our own interests or preferences, our own agendas over what the Bible actually says. So I've been trying to stick with what God says to us through the whole book of Genesis. And what we've seen is a story of hope and of a great promise being kept, perhaps one much greater than a husband sticking by his wife, of course, but nevertheless a promise being kept. Genesis reveals us as lost people and at war with God, a world in rebellion to him and bringing chaos to the right and good order that was given at creation. Remember right back in Genesis chapter 3? It reveals to us a God not undone by that chaos and rebellion, but at work to rescue and restore. And so we began to look for the one who would bring back right relationship and comfort and order, and peace. Uh, Abraham was chosen out of the muddy pit that was and is humanity, and a promise was made to him. I wonder if you remember that promise. We heard uh, a part of Genesis chapter 15, read to us a moment ago, that, that filled out some of that promise. And, and back further in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Let me read from there. The Lord said, had said to Abram, Now leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. 
I'll make you into a great nation and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And a little bit later on, to your offspring, I will give you this land. And in, in, in the Genesis reading, we had uh, Jacob was being reminded of that promise too. You see, this promise was an answer of blessing against our rebellion. The antidote for our rebellion. God's people restored to their rightful place under his good rule and with his, in his good place of safety and care. God was offering certainty and stability to a now terribly uncertain and unstable world. And so as we've journeyed on through the book of the beginning, the beginning of that promise, we've started to see the, that promise being fulfilled. Every time we've opened the pages of Genesis. There was God, sometimes obviously at work, sometimes subtly, but always faithful to his people and faithful to his promise. From Abraham to Isaac, and then at last to Jacob and Joseph. Remembering that the last section on Joseph was titled, This is the account of Jacob of Israel. God had taken the growing family of Israel and had protected them in Egypt. And by the end of chapter 47, we find Jacob frail and leaning on the top of his staff. The end of the story is near for him. Very near, as we pick it up in chapter 48, verse 1. After this, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh, and Ephraim. It's time for final words and final goodbyes. Now I want you to hear in that time what Jacob sees as central. What are his last words about? Have a look at verses 3 and 4 in chapter 48 if you've got it open and if you don't, open it. Chapter 48, verses 3 and 4. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan. (coughs) And he blessed me. And he said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I'll make you a company of peoples and I will give this land to your offspring after you for a perpetual holding. At the end of Jacob's life, even though he's in Egypt... The thing central to his discussion is the promise of God. Now Jacob has had his moments, hasn't he? A schemer, a trickster, a deceiver. But at the end of his life, what he's holding firmly onto is a promise. And I'd have to say rightly so. Through his 130 years of life... Every time he has walked past the doorway of God, rather than the doorway of the nursing home that I talked about before, every time that he has passed by the doorway of God and had a look, what he has seen is God keeping his promise. No matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation, God keeping his promise. Now, 70 family members are with him in Egypt. A family reconciled after breakdown and hatred. That family now controls all the best livestock that Egypt has to offer. They are settled in the best of the lands. His son Joseph, where he stands at Pharaoh's right hand, over all the provisions and people of that great nation. A son that he thought lost to him, he now sees. And not only that son, as we read, I didn't only get to see your face i got to see your sons as well it's beyond a person's wildest dreams to say that god has been faithful to his promise just doesn't seem to be saying enough does it at every step in everything and in every way everything has turned out just the way that god had said it would Of course the promise of God should be at the front and centre for Jacob. It's all been proven right. God has been proven trustworthy. 
Rightio. Let's put the heat on us here today. <coughs> Is God any less faithful to us? Did he keep his promises to Jacob and to Joseph, but after all that it started to break down? As we look at the story of Jacob and indeed all of Genesis, we can see God at work as plain as day, each detail falling into place. But how do we go as we look at our own lives? How do we go in the stresses and the worries? What about during the difficulties and the disappointments? What about during the strained and failed relationships? The failures of our leaders, the shortcomings of our church? What about our ongoing failure to deal with sin in our own lives? Did God do good back then and then run out of puff before he got to us? Stop and think. What was at the heart of God's promise and has he delivered on it? God's people in God's place under God's rule. A people listening to God and knowing him as their king. A people safe from the great dangers that threaten them. A people gathered together, seeking each other's good rather than their own. A people coming to unity rather than to division. Stop and think about who Jesus is and what has been delivered to us. Doesn't Jesus bring us from safe, to safety from sin and death, those two great adversaries? Doesn't he do that? Doesn't he sit over us as our loving servant king today, here, now? Doesn't he gather us together and call us to change our directions and desires? Look around. Doesn't he call us together? Has God been any less faithful to us than he was to Jacob? Are our difficulties any greater than those we read about in Genesis? Haven't we seen there people struggling with sin? Haven't we seen there people facing tragedy and grief and loss and danger? Remember that in these recent chapters, we've read about a drought that cost the people everything they had. Doesn't that sound similar? You see, I don't think that the problem is with God and his faithfulness, is it? Could it be our response to his faithfulness that needs the work? I know that it is the case for me at least. I can't hold God to short accounts for anything that he's done for me. But I can for my response to him. I'm so comfy at times that I begin to whinge if things don't go my way. I'm so cocooned that if anything intrudes into my world, I start looking for someone to blame or, or something else to fill the well. I'm so self-centred at times that I get cross with people who don't see things the way that I see them or don't like the things that I like. I find myself struggling to recognise who God is and what he's about in those moments, distracted and often unhelpful to the people around me. And you know what? I probably shouldn't be too surprised about all that either. For it says in Isaiah chapter 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. He does things differently to me. And if we have a look, we'll see it in the passage in front of us. Have a look with me <coughs> at verses 11 through to 14. Verses 11 through to 14. I think, I think Israel is starting to get a grip on this too. Israel said to Joseph, I did not expect to see your face, and here God has let me see your children also. Then Joseph removed them from his father's knees, and he bowed himself with the, his face to the earth. 
Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right and brought them near him. But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Well, it's an old man's mistake, isn't it? And clearly offensive to Joseph. After all, Israel's eyes were failing on him, thinks Joseph. Have a look at verses 17 through to 18. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, Not so, father, since this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. Verse 19. But his father refused and said, I know, my son. I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become like a multitude of nations. Why did Israel do this? In our eyes, it's a human mistake. For Joseph, it looked like that. But Jacob has been around long enough now to know that he should not always rely on human eyes. He knows that God doesn't dance to our tune or fit the pattern that we cut for him. Jacob knows it because he experienced it himself, even though he was a deceiver and a schemer. He knows that God is powerful and radical enough even to turn sin and rebellion into a victory for himself. He did it in Israel's own life. But we see it's something bigger and greater, don't we, yet? That God would even use the death of his own son at the hands of cruel rebels and turn that into the fulfilment of all his promises of safety and care for those who were at war with him. Why does God do things this way? Why does it always seem to be counter to our thoughts and ways why Ephraim the younger son why Jacob why Judah why David why Tamar and Rahab why for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord you know I think if God didn't give us such examples as this we would never be able to grasp Jesus on the cross, bleeding and dying in our place for sin. We'd never be able to get our head around it, that God could bring something wonderful out of something so horrible. We'd never be able to come to grips with the magnitude of God's power and the wonder of his grace if he hadn't been teaching us all the way along and we'd never respond as we should to his activity in the world. At this stage in Genesis, we're not looking at the fulfilment of God's promise, but a step heading towards that fulfilment. Israel is on the increase as a people. They are on the increase with regards to wealth and influence. They are being protected according to God's will and plan, and they be, they're being involved in being a blessing to the nations. What we're looking at is a promise being kept rather than a promise completed. Jacob has seen the deposit laid down and because of that, just because of that, he has a great certainty with regard to what lies ahead. Hear him speaking in verse 21. Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you. Now that's plural. He'll be with you all. And he will bring you again to the land of your ancestors. It's still before him. He's in Egypt, yet he's certain of the result. His trust is in God and it's well directed. I know we all struggle. I see your struggles and you see mine. I sometimes see your sin and sometimes you see mine. We stumble, we stagger, we fall, we blither about in the dark. But in the end, here's the most amazing thing. It is not about us. Jacob was chosen despite his sin, 
Joseph was chosen despite his age and position. What matters is the faithfulness of God and his ability to deliver exactly what he has promised. Now, Simeon saw Jesus in Luke chapter 2. He said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Can someone tell me what Simeon was waiting for in Luke chapter 2? It's really important. What was he waiting for? There's something else there. Just before that's true, he was waiting for the Messiah, but it actually says what he was waiting for. The consolation. The comfort of God to come. The consolation of Israel. And when Jesus' parents brought in that little child, Simeon said, I've seen it. The peace, the hope, the salvation, the consolation. What do we see when we see Jesus? What do you see when you see him? An interesting character of history, perhaps? <clears throat> An example of a good life lived? Or do we really see him as he truly is? the fulfilment of all God's promises and plans, the final and complete answer to the Genesis problem. I often think that we don't see Jesus big enough. Or God and his faithfulness in him complete enough. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes this, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, For in him, that's in Jesus, Every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason, it is through him that we say the Amen to the glory of God. Now that's a huge thing to get our heads around. But if we can grasp it, then we'll be able to see why Paul has the right of it in Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. How was God working for the good of all people? In Jesus. And if our faith is somewhere else, we're missing what God has been on about all this time. Do we trust, as we should, in the God who is worthy of that trust? And the question for me, very relevant, maybe it is for you too. Do our lives reflect a right and proper response to what we know is true? Let me pray for us now. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've done everything that you've promised in the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you'd help us to respond to him rightly. And we pray it in his precious name. Amen. <clears throat>